Just this past Wednesday, a young boy by the name of Riley Martin, who suffers from Down syndrome, went missing from his house along with their three dogs, disappeared in the, in the uh, um, Australian uh, wilderness area, and uh, they feared for his life. With his disability, with his young age, uh, being just four years old, uh, they thought that uh, he surely was lost to them. One couple heard about his disappearance through Facebook, and they decided that they were going to join the effort in searching for him. They uh, drove down to that area. They looked all day for him, and when darkness came, they went back to their van and, uh, and stayed in their van for the night, and the following morning, they started looking again uh, for that young boy. Their names were Lee Fo O'Brien and uh, Sally Prattley. And that morning, as they began looking for the boy, they heard a barking sound coming from a little ways away and decided to pursue that since the boy had gone missing with dogs. And when they came to the area where they had heard the sound coming from, they found the young boy laying face down under the bushes, but quite, quite well in spite of all that. Uh, they uh, decided that uh, even though he had been scratched up and even though the night had been quite cold and he could have suffered hypothermia and died during the night, that he had actually been able to survive through the night because of the presence of the three dogs that were with him who laid next to him and kept him warm with their body heat. Uh, Superintendent Shane Cribb said he took three dogs with him and they kept him company throughout the night, which was probably something that kept him with a bit of warmth. That might have been enough to get him through the night, but I suppose we'll never know. Now, as I think of the saving warmth that those dogs lying next to that little boy provided him that got him through the night, I think also about Christian fellowship and how much that is a picture of Christian fellowship. Now, I'm not talking about those times when the church may not have paid its uh, heating bill and we cuddled together uh, to stave off the, the cold. I'm, I'm talking about the closeness that we have, the interaction that we have with one another that keeps us strong through the worst of the coldness of this present world. Uh, keeps us on track, makes us accountable to one another in Jesus Christ. That's the fellowship that we find described in our text today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14 is our text, and there we find these words. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Now, the first question I'd ask as we come to this passage uh, is, who should be doing this? As we see those words, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone, who is supposed to be doing that? Well, the apostle notes that here in this verse when he addresses this passage to brethren. As he writes to the church at Thessalonica, he says, brethren, do these things. Now, I know sometimes we use the term brother today to indicate people of position in the church. Brother such and other is here with us today to bring a message from God's word. You know, we act like that was a title or something of those who are elevated in the church. But we have to understand that the New Testament never uses that term in that way. It never uses the term brother as a title for those who are in a higher position in the church. Every time that word brother is used in regard to the church in the New Testament, it has to do with the fact that we all are God's children, that we, each one of us, have been made over in his image through his son Jesus Christ, and that we come now to him as his fellow heirs, as those who are in position to inherit from the Lord because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. It is in that sense, brothers, that we're talking about every member of the body of Christ. So when Paul says here about admonishing the unruly, encouraging the faint-hearted, helping the weak, being patient with everyone, he's talking to what every person in the church should be involved in doing. So often these things that are mentioned in our text this morning are seen as the responsibility of the leadership of the church. But Paul is writing to every member 
of the church. We aren't just to be spectators engaging in meaningless pleasantries as we gather together in the Lord's name. The interaction of the members is to build up one another. We, in fact, are our brother's keepers. And as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, we are responsible for each other. We are to be bringing out the best in one another as we encourage, correct, and rebuke in the fellowship of the church. That's what fellowship is about. The word fellowship itself refers to that which people have in common, what they hold together, uh, that which is shared. And so it becomes the term for a, the gathering of God's people as they express their common faith. As fellow members of Christ's body, our fellowship is not something which is to be passive. It's something which is to be active in the church. It's something that we are to participate in, not just, uh, not just go through the motions of. What we are partners in, what we have in common as we gather together in the Lord is so important, so consequential, that this relationship means that we are yoked together to accomplish a great purpose. We are those who are marching together as part of God's purpose in this world. We are not just socially interacting with people that we like as we fellowship in the Lord's name. We are marching forward to conquer in his name, and thus our interaction always is in the context of our shared participation in God's work. You know, the church suffers when we act only as a social organization, when we exchange those hollow pleasantries and platitudes with each other. Each of you are part of the body of Christ and is to be concerned enough with your brother and sister in Christ that you are active in attempting to bring out the very best in them. How are we supposed to grow to maturity in our faith if our interaction encourages each member to settle for compromise and lethargy in the walk with the Lord? Unfortunately, that's what a lot of what goes under the name of fellowship does. It allows people to sink back into obscurity in the church instead of building one another up for the work in the Lord's name. When Paul writes here in this passage, he says those words, we urge you, brethren. The original Greek that we translate here as urge actually is a form of two words. The word there is parakaleo. That's made up of two words. The Greek word para, which uh, means from close beside, and kaleo, which means to call. In other words, this is making a call from up close and personal. This is a passionate appeal. In other words, Paul is pleading with them here, pleading with the believers to interact in this way in the fellowship of the church. This is not something which is unimportant. This is not something which is optional. This is something which is essential. As an apostle of Jesus, Paul saw the absolute necessity of the church to be intensely personal and not lukewarm or coldly dispassionate. We have too many mild or cold church fellowships. Real fellowship isn't just merely smiling and shaking hands. It's about interacting as God intended his church to do. Every member should take seriously their responsibility to bring out the best in their brother or sister in Christ Jesus. The other question I wanted to ask you this morning is, is how to do it. Our passage expresses how we are to do what the Lord has called us to do through this passage. This short verse which we've taken for our text shows how we are to treat our brother or Christ. And in each case, you notice it's according to the nature of their present walk. We are to be mindful of where our brother or sister is at in the Lord and we are to respond to them in a way that is, is focused on where they're at in their relationship with the Lord. And so he says here in this passage, admonish the unruly. Now unruly can mean a whole lot of things in the English language, can it? 
If we have someone coming up in the church and, and disrupting the service of the church, we'd call that person unruly. If we have someone trying to organize a, a protest, that person would be called unruly. Well, unruly here doesn't refer to those kinds of disruptors or di that kind of, of disrupting influence in the church. It refers to those who are not living according to God's standards and according to God's rules. They are unruly. They are out of bounds. They are slack in what they should be doing. In other words, these are people that know what God has told them to do, but they're failing to do it. They're living as if they were not responsible for keeping God's rules. When we see those in the church that have professed to have been made, to have made the Lord Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior, uh, but they are living and talking like those people who are out in the world, these are what is referred to here in this passage as unruly. And we have a responsibility to those who are walking out of bounds. We aren't to ignore their conduct so as to keep the peace. We're to love them enough to warn them about the consequences of continuing in the way that they are heading. Just as the person of an unruly child should love them enough to correct them, so we have a duty, born of love, to try to keep our brother from ruining their life to try to keep our brother from stepping out of bounds and so coming to ruin. You can't say you really care about your brother or sister in Christ if you are concerned more about your comfort zone than you are their fate. Would you let someone you love walk into the path of a speeding bus that they didn't see coming? Real, practical fellowship means we admonish those who are straying. How do we do it? We are to encourage the faint-hearted, our passage says here. You know, a lot of people in the faith sincerely want to do better than what they are presently doing and living out their faith. A lot of people sincerely wish that they were better at being a Christian. The problem is that they're too timid. Ruled by their fears, they hesitate and allow their opportunities to serve the Lord to pass them by. Their life of good intentions is being consumed by their hesitations. They're wasting all the potential the Lord placed in them. Remember the people of the parable that our Lord told uh, who uh, the steward uh, who buried his talents and was condemned when the master returned to his home? We don't want our timid brothers and sisters to account for their failure to use their talents when they stand before the Lord someday. We don't want them to have a life of good intentions that were never accomplished. So we need to be encouragers. We need to encourage the faint-hearted. We need to strengthen the timid to do greater things uh, that they are capable of doing, that God made them to do. We need to weed out the disabling fears from the fellowship as we build one another up to do what God has called us to do. And then our passage says we are to help the weak. You know, not everyone in the fellowship is, is strong. Some people are going through difficult circumstances and need the support of their brothers in Christ. They need the support of other believers around them just to get through what they're facing at this time. You know, this is a reoccurring theme in God's word that we're responsible to care for those who lack, that we're to be concerned about the weak among us. God's word spends a lot of time encouraging those people who are committed to Christ to taking care of people in need around them. Acts chapter 20, verse 35, In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said to himself, It is more blessed to give than to receive. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. James chapter 1, verse 27, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself unstained. By the world, you see that theme coming up again and again. 
there's weakness around us, God wants us to minister to those who are going through that weakness. God wants us to strengthen those who are weak. There's a true story which comes from the concentration camp in World War II. Solomon Rosenberg, his wife, their two sons, his mother, and his father were all arrested and placed in a Nazi concentration camp. It was a labor camp, and the rules were simple, as it was explained to them, as long as you can do your work, you are permitted to live. When you become too weak to do your work, then you are exterminated. Rosenberg watched his mother and father marched off to their deaths, and he knew that the next would be his youngest son, David, because David had always been a frail child. Every evening when Rosenberg came back into the barracks after his hours of labor, he searched for the faces of his family who had been made to work in different areas in the camp. And when he found them, they would huddle together, they would embrace one another, they would thank God for another day of life. But one day when Rosenberg came back, he didn't see those familiar faces. He searched throughout the barracks, looking everywhere for his family, and finally he discovered his oldest son, Joshua, in a corner, huddled, weeping, and praying. He said, Josh, tell me it's not true. Joshua turned and said, It is true, Papa. Today David was not strong enough to do his work, so they came for him. But where's your mother, asked Mr. Rosenberg. Oh, Papa, he said. When they came for David, he was afraid and he cried. Mama said, there's nothing to be afraid of, David. And she took his hand and went with him. In the fellowship of the Lord's Church, we're not just to be concerned about our own needs, about our own security. We're to care about the weak, care enough to involve ourselves in their lives and to, comfort, and to suffer the cost for doing so. We're to seek to use what the Lord has entrusted to us for the needs of our brothers in weakness around us. One other thing, as we're told what to do here in this passage, be patient with everybody. Admit it this morning, being in a close fellowship, having to deal with those who are struggling in their walk with the Lord, those who are doing less than they should, and with those who are needy, that oftentimes wears on us. It can be exhausting to be constantly dealing with the lack in other people's lives can be an exhausting thing. I think that's one reason why we isolate ourselves from fellowship and don't involve ourselves in the lives of others because it is such, such a strain on a person to be involved with the needs of other people around us, to be involved with the unruly and the faint of heart and those who are needy. That wears away on us. And one of the first casualties of involving ourselves in the lives of others can be our patience. Our patience oftentimes is taken away as we work closely with others. When the apostle says to us that we need to be patient with everybody, well, that's easier said than done sometimes. But we know that failure to be patient with others can have disastrous consequences on the fellowship. Man went into a restaurant, ordered two meals, one off the regular menu and one off the children's menu. The waitress said, well, you must be very hungry since he was by himself. He said, no, no, one's for my brother. And he reached into his pocket and pulled out a little man, five inches tall, and put him down on the table. She said, is he real? Sure, the man said. Well, well, can he walk, she asked. He said, hey, Jake, go get me that packet of sugar. And Jake walked across the table, picked up a packet, and struggled to bring it back to his brother there. Can he eat? 
Sure, Jake, eat one of those chips. And Jake climbed up on the bowl and grabbed out a chip and began munching on it there. Well, can he talk? Sure. Jake, tell her about the time we went hunting in Africa and you called the witch doctor uh, an idiot. You know, if we're impatient with other people in the fellowship of the church, it drives a wedge into the unity of fellowship. Pettiness and anger, isolation and estrangement are symptoms of impatience. And we might not be shrunk to five inches tall if we are impatient with someone in the fellowship of the church, but our standing with them is reduced to about that size. When we become impatient with our brother and sister that's going through weakness, or is unruly in their nature, or who is timid. When we become impatient with them, we do more damage than good. You know, patience is related to love. Love is selfless and self-sacrificing. Love cares more about the object of our love than ourselves. Without sincere love in the fellowship, patience is as essential as it might be, patience is impossible to maintain. And so we need love. In fact, sincere love is the essential glue to every part of Christian fellowship. What do we think of a relationship between a parent and child that if every time that parent and child are together, they can only talk about trivial things? The kind of things that you might talk with a stranger on the bus to. You'd think their relationship was strange and there was something lacking in a relationship that should be based on love. Real love goes past the superficial. Real involvement in the life of someone else requires real love. The kind of love that can only happen to us as we acknowledge our relationship with each other in Christ Jesus. A relationship which, after all, was forged by his love for us. He loved us first. And that makes possible our love in response to his, our love for him and our love for each other. This morning we want to have an invitation time. If you desire to establish yourself in the love that comes from Christ, if you'd like to be loving in your relationship with all those who love the Lord, you want to have an opportunity to be all that you should be in the fellowship of the church and in your personal life. It can only come about as you realize the Lord's love for you. So this morning, if you have a decision to make concerning your walk with Him, or if you have any decision you'd like to make publicly here, 